here's how today is going to go. We're going to start with a, a check-in, um, and then we're going to sort of start a little bit more macro and then go micro. So I'm going to offer today seven invitations around building a creative practice that are really going to speak to both some of the larger things that I, that have been coming up for my clients and my students and so many of the people I've been talking to during this unbelievable year that we're in. And then, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll spend a good amount of time on Q and a, and that's a time when we can really go into anything that's coming up from you. So I don't always love to use the word block. I think that um, we're sort of taught by society that we have blocks that aren't actually real. However, what we know to be some of these creative blocks, both psychologically and practically speaking, I'd love to get into those, anything that's coming up for you at the end of it during our Q and A time today. But I'm gonna be asking questions as we go. I really like to work in conversation with you. So feel free to utilize the chat. I encourage you to have something to write with as you go not so you can write down everything I say more so you can process some of what I'm going to ask you to process and in the moment especially if you're an in the moment processor um, to really use this time actively so I know that like in this COVID time we've all been consuming a ton of content and what I would really my intention for this time for us together today is that something happens today that will take you to where you next need to be in your creative process, whatever that is. So I don't know what it's gonna be, but I want you to really like tune into what that could be. It could be that you disagree with something I say, or it could be that you're like, yes, that's it. Or it could just be something that unlocks. And so if you can just really bear witness to that and turn on your curiosity to what is it that you need right now? And um, let's just make space for that to happen. And I'll, we'll just claim that that miracle will happen. By the end of our conversation. So I love, hi everyone, LA, New York, Puerto Rico, West Virginia, Atlanta, amazing. Okay. Um, so my work is really, like the whole point of my work is to help you, you and everybody that I work with, really liberate your most truthful and alive work, which I really feel is like the work, the creative work, it comes in many forms that you were born to do. And then so that you can share that work with an audience in a world that needs it to help all of us wake up and have a future that we're more excited to wake up to. Today's focus is going to be more on that first part of it. So not the taking the work out into the world as much as really liberating that creative work that's in you. So how would you describe your relationship with your creativity today? And I don't want you to think too hard about this. Just use a word or a couple of words or even an image How's it going? And I'd love to see that in the chat. Okay, thank you for sharing here. So I see um, frustrated, ignited again, curious, resistant, brewing, estranged, struggling. Okay, and someone, yeah, Carlos says it's tough because I'm on a deadline. Okay, I hear you. Um, struggle, not enough, tenuous. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of these. Procrastination, so I've been hearing a ton that people feel recently, um, really in the last several months with all that we're navigating, just a feeling of disconnection from creativity, a feeling of like wanting to be spending time uh, being more creative. Uh, there's a big, a lot of pressure. That meme that was going around that I wish I could eradicate that said Shakespeare wrote King Lear in a pandemic, which I don't feel has helped anyone actually do their best work, but only put a ton of pressure on us. So um, just putting, you know, putting a lot of space around however it is right now for you. Um, and now I want you to consider what it is that you would like it to be. So we have no idea what is happening tomorrow or even in the next month in this great awakening that we're in in 2020. But um, I really want to focus today on this relationship with your creativity as something that is in your control and that you do have ownership over it. So how, how do you want it to be? Deborah says confident and flowing freely. So feel free to share those in, in the chat. Here's why I talk so much about a relationship with creativity. Um, in over a 20 to 20 to 25 year history of being a creative in practice and being trained in so many different institutions, I really never understood that we are 
that the, my relationship with my creativity belonged to me and that it was something that I could have agency over. So, so much of the time we're taught that creativity is something that belongs, that is con, that sort of is conditional on something else. So it's either maybe if you had teachers growing up, they were sort of, your creativity was in their hands in that the question was always, is what I'm doing good or bad and will they like it? And that really puts this, what I believe is a sacred relationship where human beings were born to create, we, it takes the power away from us and puts it in someone else. So let me know if that resonates at all. Um, that it, and that's usually, that's really the structure of how most of us are trained in our, in our, in our early years. And really <laughs> it went all the way through to my master's. So um, this idea, and, and, then, and then in our professional careers, it can really feel like our relationship with our creativity is dependent upon the industry, dependent upon whether or not we have a job, dependent upon am I working or not right now, who my collaborators are. So I want you to try on the, the idea today that this is a relationship that belongs to you and that you do, I don't necessarily believe we can control creativity. In my mind, she is, I, I think of her as a wild mistress, as like a woman with this, who's always wearing like incredible at, big skirts and outfits and she sort of flourishes in and flourishes out and she can't, we can't always predict when she's gonna show up. But I do believe that her, my relationship with her no longer rests in whether I get a book deal, whether I get a TEDx, all of these things that in the past had really kind of let, you know, either I was on or I was off and that was all in somebody else's hands. So all of that is in spirit of how do you want this relationship to be? Yeah, and I'm just hearing some things in the chat. Catherine says, my inner critic is very loud. Yes, Catherine, thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna talk about that. My word for the inner critic is the tiny terrorist, but. We all have our different words for it. And it's really normal. Those voices show up when we are in the midst of progress and change. So not only, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but not only are we in this moment of collective change, so it's really normal that voices of resistance are going to show up internally for us right now, but we're also, we're, it's the intersection of individual and collective change. So the fact that those voices are showing up as unpleasant as it is, I'm actually I'm happy they are because that means that you're on the precipice of some kind of a shift or breakthrough in your own work. So if, if anyone else is noticing that, it's, it's really a pain, I know, but also it comes when we are daring to grow. Um, okay, I'm going to take a look at the chat for a second. Yeah, so I'm seeing, Right. Okay. How we want it to feel more focused and uncensored. Yeah. We're going to talk about focus today because I believe focus is a tool we really need to utilize at this moment specifically free flowing. Okay. Great. Adventure. Some consistent, inspired, vibrant, stepping up to the plate. Awesome. So let that be your guide today. As I really do want you to leave this conversation with what is my next inspired move? What is my next brave thing in service of whatever, my, however my creative process wants to grow. So keep letting this word, these words that you want to feel with it be, be a guide for you. Okay. Here's the first invitation. And this is to give yourself and your creative process permission to change. Give yourself and your creative process permission to change. We are um, in a time where you, if you are paying attention, if you are awake in this moment, there's no way your processes can't change. There's no way, if we are awake to all that may be dismantling and building back up and all of the changing systems in our culture and in our larger world, if you are an awake artist, if you are listening and open, there's no way they won't affect your personal and individual systems. So some things I've been hearing a ton recently is like, I was in this flow and I was kind of getting something going and then all of a sudden everything happened and like, I can't seem to show up anymore or I can't, what was working was not, is not working anymore. And let me know if that resonates at all with you. Um, that is not wrong. <laughs> That means you are alive and tuned in. I'm actually worried, more worried on a larger level about the people who have, who are able to actually shut everything out and just keep on going the way things have been going. So Arundhati Roy, who's a really brilliant novelist, you've probably seen it. There's a quote floating around about the pandemic being a portal. 
Um, and it's really like our choice. Like, do we want to step into the portal and let go of all the things that have been dragging us down culturally and individually? But she says like that, that a return to normal will be disastrous. Don't quote me on that. I believe that, I believe that is what she says. Um, but something like, and we've been talking about this a lot in our, in our larger conversations is that there, we're going to, we're not going back to normal. And so I want to take that idea to your practice as well, which means like I, I lead a community and we were working on creative practice before COVID hit. And we, everyone was really working on these like daily moments of showing up and whether that's an hour in the morning or half an hour, all of these different containers that can help our creativity flow. Not that I don't believe in it. However, if it, and then, then the last several months have happened and people have not been able to find the same ground. So your process and your um, person, yourself, will change with the world. So this is just all to say that you have an opportunity now to, to build a creative practice that is better than whatever the one is that you had before. And, um, and, and Colleen is even saying I'm the opposite, so I was not being creative in hibernation, but now I feel the urgent need to reawaken, make up for lost time. Yeah, Colleen. So there are these seeds that live in the forest that don't bloom, blossom. Yeah, I guess seeds blossom. They don't blossom until forest fires happen. And they lay dormant for like seven to eight years. And then when forest fires happen, that is when those plants actually grow. So it's also really natural at this time, if you feel like that's another thing that's happening, is that your process may be like roaring. You may be sort of being spoken to and kind of called forth. And anyone who is awake right now, your mission and your purpose is going to be expanding. But I say all this because our nervous systems and those voices of resistance in the tiny terrace inside of our head can often feel a ton of resistance when things are starting to change. And you might be feeling that on a larger level, but it also happens personally. So it's like, wait, whoa, we were, you know, this worked for us before. Why isn't this working now? Or we were really focused on this before. Something that's happened to a lot of my clients is they're, um, because I really think about, you know, your purpose here is much bigger than a particular role or title in this world. So though you all may identify with specific titles, um, the, the larger thing that you're here to do is actually transcends any kind of actor, writer, director, producer, however you may self-identify. And so you may be feeling a call toward a new, what I would just call, project, like, you know, those are all projects to express your purpose that uh, might be new for you. So maybe you've been, you feel called to write, even though you haven't been writing, or you feel called to take on a leadership role, even though you haven't been taking on leadership in, in the past. And again, that is just, a, that is you being awake to the times. That is you listening. That is the mission expanding. Also, I want you to embrace process because we're so culturally addicted to before and after. You, you know this, like we just, we love it. We love the TV shows and we love skipping the steps. We love skipping kind of in our cultural narrative, that mucky place. And I really truly believe that that mucky place is where your greatest, most alive, liberated work comes from. So if you're feeling that, and that's the process of change, the non-linear real process of change versus the sort of edited reality TV version of change, that is, yes, Raina says, bless the mess. That's right. Um, and, but again, right, your nervous system will often pull back and not want you to trust that because it feels foreign and, and, and uncomfortable. Creatively, you are in a rebirth right now. Collectively, rebirth, but creatively, you're also in a rebirth. And so it's going to feel, and I'm actually currently eight months pregnant, so I'm also like really full of birth metaphors, but, um, but it's not pleasant and it's not necessarily comfortable, but it is, it is what is happening for anyone who's paying attention. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm full of, it's taught me so much about creativity. It really is, is awakening me. So just start to think about like, I really want to give you permission of a blank slate around, around your creative process. 
And what would happen if you actually give yourself permission to reinvent it at this time? Okay, we're gonna go on to invitation number two. Oh, this is a quote from Toni Morrison. And I'm sure you've seen this. This is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Another thing I've been seeing a lot recently for anyone who is feeling called to any kind of an activist space or any kind of really responding to what is happening in our moment right now is people are feeling like that can be at odds with their creative practice. And I really want to encourage you that these are all connected. So your art, your creativity work right now may be being awake in the world and paying attention and using your senses and waking up to what you're hearing, what you're seeing. We don't know how that's going to affect your, your creative practice, whether it's, you know, how that's going to deepen your scene work, how that's going to shift whatever writing project you're working on or you may be starting on. But that's not, an, that's not, it's not putting anything on pause. It's not an aberration. It will deepen your work. So, I really want you to think too about how um, if you're feeling called to show up in this moment, that's you being an artist. That is you being a creative. It's not you letting yourself down that you um, didn't, you know, write the 20 pages you said you would write this week. We will talk about structure though at the end because that is also important. Okay, um, we're gonna go to number two. So let everything be a door. Um, I'm going to actually just read this quote too. So this is from Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And this idea about a door really is just that I hear a lot that we're waiting for inspiration or motivation or that something I hear a lot is just like, I'm not feeling inspired or I'm, I'm having trouble. Where is my motivation? And I can't really find it. And uh, I just want to open up the idea that motivation and inspiration does not always feel good. And it's not always that like, and we all know that feeling, right? It's like you wake up one day and all of a sudden things feel like clear. And you're like, I can't wait to whatever it is, get to the page today or start, you know, do a Zoom scene because I know that's how we're doing our acting right now with someone. But we forget that like there's also a ton of other ways in that are way less comfortable and beautiful or beautiful feeling, inspirational feeling, but just as potent. So I'll be clear here that I'm not talking about taking up trauma that you might be in the middle of and turning it into any kind of art right away. But I am saying that we're not going to wait until we feel ready or we're not going to wait until we feel um, hashtag inspired because we could wait for a really long time. Um, so, so Clarissa offers, if we have a deep scar, that is a door. If you have an old, old story, that is a door. If you love the sky and the water so much, you almost cannot bear it, that is a door. If you yearn for a deeper life, a full life, a sane life, that is a door. And this, this idea came to me when I was coaching a client who has a book deal right now. And she was just like, this was not the way the book deal was supposed to go. Like she just had an idea. So, so much that we have um, is happening in these last several months is like, this was not the way. And you, if your brain has said things to you, like this was not the way it was supposed to go. This was not the way her book deal was supposed to go. And what we worked on in the, um, to answer your question, Steve, let, let everything be a door. That's the idea, Steve, right? So like whatever is coming in the, happening to you in your life and in the cultural moment, let that be a way in and see where that takes you. Um, we just had to let her frustration, her resistance, her like, this is not the way it's supposed to go, be a gateway because we can't wait for that to abate. She's, she's writing this book, it's happening and it was, it's not going the way it's supposed to go. Um, and same goes for, again, it's going back to the like, whatever you're experiencing around the anti-racist movement in America and all of these things that are happening, those are doors too in your creative process. Take the lid off. So um, I think this is a time for the wild ideas that may have been, uh, you, you know, we all have that list of like wild ideas or things we're like, I, I daren't, I daren't. Um, and 
I do believe that this moment that we're in is an invitation to take the lid off our creative work. Now, I know that I'm saying that and it can be like, well, Liz, like I can't, this feeling of like, I, I'm, I'm not on set. I can't actually be doing my creative work. And I encourage you to find ways to take the lid off your work anyway, whether that is in the, the acting work that you're able to do over, you know, I know people are like filming Zoom movies and I know none of it feels the same. But again, to not let the conditions of the industry but be what is permitting you, uh, um, preventing you from your creative flow. So I really, the image I have here is always like that pasta pot that is boiling. And when the pasta is just like boiling beyond, this is what happens to me because I know, I'm not good at like monitoring the temperatures, um, but the water starts to overflow. And, and I really want to invite you why not? Now is the time to let your work get bolder in whatever way that is. Um, and this might be just part of this is going to, and we'll, this will go into the next thing we're going to talk about, but just letting go of some of the, the limits that you may have, you may be carrying from the past or that like, you know, I really believe most of us are given the mem memo that we're both too much and not enough at the same time. So if you could let go of that, right, whether you gravitate more toward being told you're too much or whether you gravitate more toward being, toward being told you're not enough, what if, you know, just a, like a, a thought exercise in the moment, right? If you were free of those um, conditionings, which we're going to talk about in a minute, what, what would you do? If you had 10 times the courage, which you do, by the way, but if you had 10 times the courage, what, how, how would you approach your work? What would you do? Or what projects would you start? So this is like, you know, an invitation to wildness, both in terms of like maybe a new idea, but also whatever it is that you're working on. I want you to think about shaking up the process. Selena says, what wouldn't I do? Yes. And I encourage you, if that's an activating question, to take it, um, to do some writing on that. What would I do if I had 10 times the courage? Because you do have 10 times the courage and see what comes up. And if you feel bold, feel free to share that in the chat. Okay, I'm going to number three. Yeah, so this is a continuation of this. Owning the difference between intuition and conditioning. We've developed this trend in creativity. Uh, and I, I believe that some of it is, and with all homage, you know, with full honor of some of the wonderful books that have been written about creativity, they start, they start to give us ideas in our head about sort of identities we have as a creative. So these can be like, I'm a perfectionist, or I, um, I am really good at starting things but not finishing them, or I self-sabotage. Uh, I have imposter syndrome. And these are all real concepts. And I'm not, like, we all feel them. They are all absolutely real concepts. But what happens is we can start making them such a calcified part of our identity that we're really letting, and so many of them come from conditioning that we were, you know, so much of why we may be feeling like an imposter is because many of us may have grown up with identities that didn't teach us that our voices or our contributions were as important as other people's voices or contributions. So of course, things like imposter syndrome really are, are, they're so connected to this larger conversation we're having right now around white supremacy, around patriarchy in our culture. And so much of the time in the self-development kind of creativity space, we're taught like, no, that's my problem. I have imposter syndrome. I'm a perfectionist. And I want to encourage you at this time, at this potential reinvention of your relationship, your creativity, and your creative process, I want to encourage you to let go of any of those labels that you might be carrying around that actually continue the, the cycle, even though it can be helpful to self-identify and be like, yeah, I am experiencing that. But even just the shift of like, I have imposter syndrome to I'm experiencing, I'm experiencing some imposter syndrome right now. Do you see that shift? Because when I say I have imposter syndrome, I am reinforcing the conditioning that taught me that my voice maybe is not as valuable as a certain type of dominant voice in power, for example. And this really bleeds into our creative, 
creative practice. So what would it be like to have a creative practice where I'm actually, I'm no longer uh, gonna say that I'm that person, I have it, or I'm, um, what are, and feel free to share some of the other ones that come up. I'm, I'm, um, I self, I'm a terrible self-sabotager. I hear that one all of the time. Um, and I hear a ton, something I hear a ton is I'm really bad at finishing things. And let me know if that resonates with you. I'm really good at starting things. I'm really bad at finishing things. There are all kinds of things that come up around that. But again, depending on how you identify in this world, you may have been taught somewhere along the line, and this is what conditioning is, that it would be unsafe to finish something, or that you finishing something might mean that you become too big, or that it's actually more important for you to take care of other people than it is for you to follow through on your creative voice or your vision or whatever it is that you're creating. This may not be true for everybody, but for many of us, we do have, we have some of that conditioning. And so um, a lot of times it can start, it can be really hard to distinguish between the voice of your intuition, which I might call like the sound of your genuine or that higher, that higher voice inside of you and the sign of the old conditioning. So the more that you can start to separate those voices and get really clear, like, oh, that's, that's might be real. I might be hearing that voice that says like, no, nah, maybe you should give up or not finish this thing or whatever it is. And, um, that's not me. It might be true, right? It might, I mean, it might be real in my head, but it's not true. So I want you to just start noticing the conditioning as in the conditioning I'm using. It's, it really comes in the form of those inner critic voices. So, um, yeah, I want to just go to the chat for a second. I can be such a perfectionist that I won't start until I think I can do it near perfectly. So things don't get done. Right. And so thank you for sharing that Maggie. So if, if you listen to the voice of your intuition, most likely your intuition, which also another way to just sort of distinguish between the two of those is that the conditioning, if you tune into whatever that thought is, will usually come with some kind of physical constriction. So if you just start to like, whatever the thought is, right? I can't, um, I can't start because I can't guarantee that it will be perfect. That's something that happens a lot. Or I can't guarantee that it'll be worth my time. I can't guarantee that I will be a success and therefore I will not do it. That will often make your body uh, constrict. So thoughts like that will. Um, but if you listen to your intuition, Right? If you just say like, I want to talk to my intuition about this. Okay, conditioning, I hear you, right? I got to get it perfectly or I'm not worthy or I'm not whole until I make this thing perfect. But if you listen, if you really just say, you know, I want to talk to my higher self. I want to talk to my intuition. I want to talk to the voice inside of me that knows. Just see what comes up. Usually, and, and by the way, that voice is not usually first. So for most of us, this is conditioning. That's, this is the power of conditioning. It's the first voice that we hear a lot of the time. So it can be like, oh, I have, you know, I'm feeling the inspired idea. And then right away, the voice in conditioning is like, well, it didn't work the last time. Or who are you? That's, it comes often in that form, right? Conditioning, tiny terrorist voice says, who are you to do that? You haven't proved yourself yet. Or there's other people doing that. Um, that's usually the first voice. We usually have to like, okay, I hear it. I hear you conditioning. Thank you for your feedback. Um, I'd like to invite you to take a step back to a conversational distance. I'm really into the idea of like socially distancing from your conditioning. Um, and I want to hear something else. And usually if you ask your intuition, your intuition will have something for you that's not affected by that by those teachings of the culture, by the teachings of the families of origin, by the teachings of any of those structures, we're not blaming anything, but any of those structures that were actually not designed for you to have that sovereign and empowered relationship with your creativity and to, to trust your own creative voice. So, so much of our goal is about building that trust with your creative voice. So the more you can just keep saying, I just want to hear, let me listen to over here see what happens and give it time because if you're not used to, to tuning in there, it can take some time, but just keep saying, I want to, I want to hear what my intuition says around this. And usually it'll say things like, go on, you got this. Like, let's explore this. 
Um, it, it might just keep telling you the idea. So sometimes the intuition is just like, don't care about the, all that stuff, but just what about this idea? <laughs> and it'll, it'll keep knocking at you. Sometimes it, it, it'll, you'll feel it in specific places. You'll feel it in your heart space. You can often feel it in your throat. Um, it'll just, it'll kind of keep gnawing at you until you give it some attention. Getting rigorous about this distinction can transform, will, can transform all of your creative work. When you're on set, in your writing practice, whatever it is that you're working on right now, um, taking away, starting to eliminate, eliminate the, the sort of older way you have been taught. So we really, most of us have to unlearn a lot of things we were taught so we can listen to what we know. And you could come to set that day and like you can start, you will be a different actor. People, it's, there's like, what, what has been liberated? And so much was just like, just letting go of that, of those old voices. Um, and, and it can be really helpful for those of you who have a writing practice or who are doing any kind of solo, any kind of solo creative work, if you choreograph or if you're spending time alone, before you work to just set a timer, if this is, if the conditioning is loud for you on any particular day. So someone was saying, um, I, the, the perfectionism voice is really, really loud. So it's like preventing you from getting to the, to what you're trying to start. Just let it go for two minutes. Let perfectionism talk on the page, write it out because it's better out than in and let it write out for two minutes. Um, and then the timer's over at two minutes and then we socially distance. And again, you have to keep socially distancing. It's like the people who won't wear masks got to keep, uh, keep putting that conditioning back, but that's part of the training. So it is really a muscle that we're building. Curate your inputs. All right. Who is feeling, who is feeling overwhelmed by content, overwhelmed by the things coming at us through the screens. Um, just give me, give me any kind of feedback if that's coming up for you. I'm seeing nods. Especially if you are any, and most creative people have empathic tendencies in them. So especially if you're, an, if you also identify as an empath or as a highly sensitive person, the the energy that is coming at us, and it's not bad or good, like I'm not going to qualify it, but the energy that is coming at us from all of the sound right now can uh, be deeply overwhelming. And it can also really, we, we're spending, some of us can be spending way out of balance, we can be way out of balance with how much we're taking in versus how much we're outputting. So one thing that you do have control over though is really what, what inputs you're taking in. And I know when you go on social media, you can't control what you see, but to tend to our relationship with our creativity, which wants you to do way more listening. doesn't mean that you don't want to take in some of what's going on. Cause again, that's you being an awake artist, but most of us have an out are out of balance with that. We're, we're taking in too much. So how can you just get a little more rigorous with, what voices you're listening to and how, how you can stop listening to some of them. And particularly if you have any voices in your life right now, and they may not be related necessarily to the news, but they could be um, something that happens to a lot of us is we keep following advice from gurus and mentors and leaders who actually don't align with us anymore or who make us feel shame or badly about ourselves. Um, but if you're taking in any kind of really anything that is, is not making you feel, I'm not going to say good because I will say that like, I certainly take in inputs that challenge me, particularly right now around what's happening. So I don't use like, Oh, I just want to feel good and only comfortable. We're not talking about that, but we're talking about, um, if you are consistently taking in things that prevent you from creating, that prevent you from being in your flow, that's just an old pattern that we have to like keep keeping us from doing the thing. And we got to mute those. We got it. the mute tool on, on Instagram and social media is a wonderful tool. Um, another thing that I make a requirement of most everyone I work with is that if possible, unless your job demands it, your, 
your first waking hours are not spent listening to other people's voices, but they're spent listening to your own. Now, I know there are all kinds of conditions and situations with little ones and families where we're not always able to do that. But specifically, I mean the rolling over when I wake up and I'm checking Instagram. Um, and it can be really natural to do that right now because we have been in this collective trauma in so many different ways. But one of the ways you'll start to activate those words you had at the beginning, right? I want to feel more flow. I want to feel more free in my creativity is to take in less and what you're taking in to make it higher quality, more nourishing. So especially if you have a particular project that you're working on, asking yourself what, just asking your intuition, like what do I need to be reading, watching, taking in for this project? And oftentimes it becomes like, it's not things that you necessarily would think of. Like sometimes your intuition will be like, you need to read this novel and you're not even sure why it's connected to whatever you're working on. But um, that's something we forget, especially we just, we're so on all the time when we're, when we're putting some containers around a, a particular creative project that we're working on. We forget to think about, okay, I gotta, I gotta look at my inputs. I gotta look at like, who am I listening to? What am I reading? What am I watching? Um, and the more boundaries we can have, the better. Yes. Um, not able to do all the things I did to alleviate stress and to feed my creativity. So I'm filling with way too much screen time. Yeah. Another thing I just want to say, let us take any kind of beating ourselves up about that away because it's really human right now because we actually are sort of yearning for connection and it is a place for connection. So again, um, the more we can be intentional about our use of those times though. So it is like, okay, if I'm going to go on social media, I'm going to do something intentional there. And then when I'm in my creative space, I will be turning off the noise. And uh, we, it is not, the goal right now is not to be fully indistractable because I think we're gonna get distracted by the changing world that's going to happen but the more of indistractable on a micro level so I'm gonna say okay an hour it's off and you know what if something if the world burns down in an hour I will tend to it when I come back um, and just start to look throughout your day where you're really because this is where we start to leak energy so where you may be or you may be just slipping on some of that and now is a really good time to just tighten back up some of those boundaries with all of the inputs so that we can have more output. Um, source your original spark. So my original spark is my word for your inner child, for your inner light, for that, for that candle inside of you that is always lit. Your original curiosity and your original courage. And um, right now, <laughs> we really need this more than ever. And it, a question we can ask here Specifically, if you are an empath, if you have been really responding, 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 and if you're an actor, your job is to respond. So you're conditioned emotionally to respond to what's coming at you. So to just flip that for a second and think, what is the energy I do want to bring to this, even to this next couple of weeks? Okay, as we're in whatever we're in right now, what is the energy I do want to bring? And you can often go back to that little, that little light inside of you and ask for some energy from that place. So this can be um, just reconnecting to moments of awe and reconnecting to a, curio a wild curiosity like that in that sort of brazen courage that so many of us have. We, I believe we still have it. It just gets covered up by all kinds of conditioning. Um, going, even just going back to like, I have clients who just keep a little, you know, picture of, of you as a little one somewhere nearby or going back to an activity that you really loved as a little one as a source of energy and um, renewal at this time. It doesn't mean you're not paying attention to what's going on in the world, but it just means to sustain, to fuel. I need to source some of that original light in that part of me that was not as affected by the, by those conditioning. So anything you can do to connect to that, um, and feel free to share in the chat, just anything you do to connect to curiosity and to connect to your original spark. And we're going to talk about the last one today is 15 minutes and 
And I really just recommend, even if you can just do this for 15 minutes a day. So the, the seventh invitation is starting small to go big. Um, right now, Diana says playing piano and dancing, finding reasons to laugh. Yeah. And joy, spontaneous solo dance party. Yes. Um, joy is part for anyone who is engaged also in the, the movement right now in any kind of activism work. Joy is part of activism. And taking that, take, that is one of the things that you as a creative are, you bring to this moment is your ability to source joy and awe and you connect to joy and awe and curiosity much easier much more easily than many, many people in our, in our world. And that is a way that you can support our sustainability to, to carry on in the, in the name of progress. Um, spont okay, playing, yes, finding reasons to laugh. Okay, I read that, great. Um, all right, so now I just wanna talk about the structures in your creative practice. So I'm gonna talk about a, a practice of 15 minutes a day. But before we do that, I just wanna know from you, how are you showing up for your creativity right now? What, in whether it's working or it's not working, what are you, do you wake up in the mornings and do something? What are, what have you been doing? Something I have noticed with so many of my clients is that we need to make the containers a bit smaller right now. And that may mean just that like the commitments are smaller. So I'm not, again, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying I'm going to write King Lear. I'm saying I'm going to show up for 15 minutes a day for the next five days. And that's about what I can commit to. Um, or I'm, you know, instead of that long three to six month goal, I'm just going to focus on what I'm going to do this month. So that we're sort of shortening the, the timelines a bit, both on a daily basis and on a, on a longer term planning basis because of the way everything is reorganizing right now. And so really working to focus the energy in the moment versus make a ton of long-term plans that, as we all know, have continued to shift. Um, okay, so Maggie feels late night after everyone is asleep. Yeah, so studies show that this is not true for everyone, but we are most connected to our creativity in the early mornings and, and at night. It's really interesting. And let me know if that resonates with you. Um, and, and a lot of people feel like actually the afternoon time is some of the a time when you are less, less, it, it's harder to get things going, which is why for a lot of my clients in my work, I recommend that that's a time where you have meetings and do a little bit more admin because I do notice, at least for myself, that it's the mornings and the evenings that do, um, it just flow is easier. Okay, great. So people have morning routines, vocal and singing warm ups. Great. Turna says, showing up for SAG after workshops, not canceling for me is big. Yes. And if anyone has sort of had trouble with like setting up things and then not showing up for them, or if you've ever sort of said, I'm going to do this thing and then I, and then I don't. Um, a reframe I want to offer you there is that anytime you make a commitment to your creativity, it's not setting yourself up on a paradigm of like, I'm either succeeding or failing, but it is an opportunity for you to create deeper trust with yourself. So showing up every day, if you're interested in some kind of a daily practice, is a way to build trust with yourself. One of my clients literalized that, liter made this literal by, it's based on this Brene Brown idea of when we're building trust with someone. She has this metaphor, when we're building trust with anybody in a relationship, it's like adding a marble to a jar. Do you know this metaphor? So she says like, if, if I'm, you know, I'm in a relationship with money and every time we do something that builds trust, it's like one more marble goes in the jar. And um, I really loved that. And I shared it with this client and she, she took that as she's building her creative practice. Okay, I'm building my trust with myself. Every time I show up for my creative practice, I'm building more trust with myself. So she got a jar and she started to use coins, which I love too, because it's like paying yourself for showing up, which I think is fab. Um, but every time she showed up, she put some coins in the jar. And just as that uh, kind of making it, um, it manifest that I am, this is a way that I am 
learning how to rely on myself more. I'm holding my, honoring my own commitments is about me and me. It's about my relationship with me and my creativity. And uh, so I encourage you, if that is a helpful reframe, if you have been in the habit of like, oh, there I go again, I started the thing and I'm not doing the two hours a day or I'm not writing eight hours a day like Stephen King, um, because it is your practice, you own it and you will, you have to create the boundaries and the way you are relating to yourself around it. We don't want to sort of instead uh, take ways you may have been taught in the past, right? Like, so, I mean, I grew up in the ballet world and it was so, it's wonderful discipline, but it was very shame-based in the way that we were taught. And so I, in my creative practice, I have to like not repeat that because shame actually doesn't sustain showing up. It gets you to show up for a certain amount of time, but it doesn't just sustain for a long time. Um, I'm going to go to the chat for a second. Um, yeah. So Catherine says joined a voiceover collective. I cannot recommend enough seeking community at this time around your creative practice. If that is helpful for you, we just know accountability works. I'm sure you've read all of the statistics about how much more likely we are to show up for something if we are involving other people in that. So if that is something that's working for you, I highly encourage it. And I also highly encourage that you put your creative time on your calendar so that if I were to come have a conversation with you and take a look at your Google calendar, I would know where your priorities are. So you're putting meetings on the calendar, you're putting meetings with your collaborators and all those other things. But I also want to see where is your time for your practice. Is anyone are you watching the, there's this Michael Jordan documentary called The Last Dance on, I think it's ESPN. I'm fascinated by sports routines, the way athletes are really taught to own their pre and post routines and also to, to sort of own their practice in a way that I don't believe all artists are really taught to do that. And especially actors, we, we often are just so focused on doing the job that we're not like that before and after both of like being on set, audition, scene work. I really believe that's a time that you, that is a place where you have control and you can really up level your work in those practices. Um, but I think it's just way more common in sports that, that, that they actually really tend to that. So that is another place that you can just start to tune up a little bit during this time. Um, I use a tool called the Creative 15, which is 15 minutes a day of non-results oriented creative practice. And I can send you all a link if you want more info about it. But it the, the idea here being to make a commitment to creativity that is easier to say yes to than it is to say no to. And so often we make the commitment bigger than sometimes we can always commit to, and then we're just, we're constantly sort of letting ourselves down. So this idea of like, if I can only do 15 minutes a day today, and I am not going to put pressure on the results, but I'm just gonna put pressure on the showing up and turning off the noise and being open to what happens. Um, people have written like books with this, with this method, and sometimes you'll go over them 15 minutes, but it is a container for you to touch your creative work every day even when we are in the middle of great collective awakening crisis, all that we are navigating. Okay, I am going to, um, yes, people are into the last dance. <laughs> um, okay, creative 15 link. Yes, that is, okay, it's lizkimball.com slash creative 15. If you just go there, um, we, I've led these live and it, we're not having a live one anytime soon, but you can sign up there and you'll get all of the 15 days of prompts and you can even watch some of the zoom calls, but it'll give you, you'll get all the, all the guidance and it can just help, help to get you going. And then most people who do it end up continuing it because it's just helpful link in the chat. You got it. Um, here are the seven invitations, but I'm just curious for you right now, which one do you need? Which one do you need? Would you, if you were to just take one of these ideas and bring it into your life, um, bring it into your creative practice, just like ask your intuition, what, what could I really give myself permission for in the coming weeks? Let's really just look at the coming weeks and the coming month, because again, let's keep the, keeping the shorting, shorter term planning can be really useful. 
Yes, yeah, starting small, says Sean. Yes. Josette says not freezing at the door. Yeah. And I would love, you know, when we freeze, something that can be sort of a gentle approach to freezing is curiosity, which you are all wizards at. You're, you're, professional, you're professional curiosity people. So you have the ability to be at the door without sort of pressuring yourself not to feel whatever that door is, but just seeing um, what's here. Okay, what's happening? Just using that curiosity. Okay, taking the lid off. Yes, taking the lid off. Um, and a great little breath mantra. I forgot to say this, but when I'm talking about the difference between intuition and conditioning, so much of the, again, the intuition is body focused and conditioning is brain focused. So just thinking about the conditioning, many of us receive that creativity is in our head, is, is rests here. Um, when creativity really comes from our hips and comes from our whole body, comes from our breath. Uh, so a mantra you can use is inhale. Wait, I want to get this right because I always mix up the words. Um, Good. Inhale permission and exhale pressure. And even just as you're doing this, right, I see you doing this amazing. Inhale permission, permission to take the lid off my work, to let it get wild. Exhale all of the pressure to make it perfect, to make it, um, get it right. Inhale permission and exhale pressure. That's one we've been using a lot because this was sort of more earlier in the spring, but there's there was a lot of pressure online to be sort of overly creative and overly productive, that sort of hyper productive creativity overdrive that really comes from our hustle culture conditioning. Um, and that's in many ways just sort of continuing on that old those old structures and those old systems. And that can really seep into our creativity, meaning, I am not doing a good job if I'm not producing, producing, producing. Um, and really the, the new paradigm that I think many of us are starting to explore is creativity is a cycle. Creativity involves stillness. Creativity involves those moments of pr productivity, but it, it really is a, a cyclical cycle that mirrors nature. It mirrors so many things, right? So there are periods in your creative process, and this may be coming up for you, where you're not actively producing like 20 pages or like four videos, but you're just in that fertile, that um, fertile void space when, you know, before anything forms, that before the universe forms, there was a fertile void. That is, <laughs> the universe would never formed, have never formed without the fertile void. If you think of any kind of process in nature or in our bodies, there's always that period. So if you've been going through that period, I want you to trust the fertile void in that that is the precursor to whatever your next project is. I'm going to go to the chat for a second. Okay. Six source your original spark. Yes. Um, let everything be a door. Um, give myself permission to have a different practice than before. Amazing. And I, yeah, it's a really brave showing up for 15 minutes. I'm telling you, I want to know how it goes because it also was something that was developed during time during a time of crisis several years ago for um, again because 15 minutes felt like all we could give during a it was back in 2016 when many of us were sort of figuring out how to move forward from there and sometimes that is um, and we're doing it we did it again during COVID-19 and it can be a really useful practice when there's so much going on in the world and you can get a lot done. Okay. Um, Carla says the challenge is to let go of the pressure to be commercial with my creativity since that's how I earn. Okay. Got it. And I'm happy to address that in the Q and a, if maybe Melissa, you can help me flag that. Um, okay, great. So how are we doing on time? I can't see my clock, but I'd love to ask before we go to Q and a, what is one thing just based on where you are uh, right now, what is one thing that you will do in service of your creativity, in service of whatever creative practice you're building, 
And I'm not going to say like in the next 24 hours, let's just give you, you know, in the next several days or even in the next week, what is one thing you will do to take this, to take these ideas into practice? Alexandra says, just start. Okay, great. And I would love you, the dare here is just to put that like, Decide when you're going to start and maybe even put on your calendar or tell someone and your only job is to start. It is not to be good or do anything else, but just to start. Okay. Finally set up my recording commit commitment. Do the Liz Kimball process. Yes. Audition for more voiceover work. Not take my abundance of creativity for granted. Yes. When you receive a lot of creative flow, you want to say thank you. That's right, because that means you have opened up yourself to creativity, to your, to your flow. It's incredible, and you just want to keep saying thank you. I am ready for more, and just no, want you want to have places for that creativity to go. So if you're receiving a lot of ideas, you want to put um, you want to make sure you have containers for those ideas to come. So you always tell creativity, yes, more, please. I cannot necessarily act, you know execute every idea, but every time you send me an idea. I will at least put it somewhere so that it has a place to go because creativity without containers is a flood. We really want to just set up those containers um, in our practice. Okay, work on American accent. <gasps> oh, I love that. I have a client who specializes in American accent. Her name is Rebecca. Um, oh my gosh, pregnancy brain. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm going to think about it by the end of this session. Um, but she... She's a, she has a lot of stuff, a lot of great content on the internet too. Okay, show up for myself first. That's it, Catherine, right? So that's how we can show up for these larger things is first just tuning into our own voice. I encourage you to try it and see how it goes. All right, um, let's open it up to questions. Does that feel good, Melissa? Yes. Um, and yeah, so folks, if you have questions, just it helps if you write in the chat question and then include the question. But I'll flag that, um, Liz, you were saying the, the question about the challenge is to let go of pressure to be commercial with creativity since it's how um, this person earns money. I really honor that. Um, and something I want to just share around that is there may be a story set up that commercial does not equal me at my most creative. And I would encourage you just to see um, what happens if I tell a new story about when I am letting myself really open up to my creativity, my potential for commercial success actually, actually expands. And I know, I know that we have, there are all kinds of limits and, and things they're going to tell you that otherwise, but just even if you, I'm not sure exactly what it is that you do, whoever asked this question. But notice if that story is actually holding you back a little bit and see like, why can't I bring my most alive creativity to my commercial work and see what happens? Or that I'm just giving myself time during the day to, to play at my edge. And then, okay, I go and spend time maybe writing what somebody wants me to write or whatever it is, sort of more of that fulfillment, but how, might, how that might affect it later. Um, because we would never want the whatever kind of commercial conditions of the industry to keep you from always, always expanding your creativity. That is what keeps you alive as a human being. That is your divine right. And so notice where you may have sort of made some constructions there and see if you can blow that up a little bit and see what happens um, while still, of course, making your money doing it. But maybe it's just about giving yourself 15 minutes a day of like, okay, what would I do if there was no constraints? and seeing then how that affects the other stuff. Let me know if that, how that helps. Um, I see questions here, but Melissa, I'll let you facilitate if you have. Oh, go for it. So yeah, I was okay. gonna flag Marina's uh, question about tips for overcoming creative blocks when writing. Um, can you tell me what creative blocks you're experiencing? I encourage you to, to go to the Creative 15 because what we did every day was some kind of, some kind of physical practice or sort of what I, what I think happens sometimes with writing is we're trying to go to zero to 100. And I think that sometimes if we can build a little bit of a bridge to our practice, uh, it can just help us get into it. So that could be doing five minutes of movement, doing um, 
taking a particular prompt and just writing on that particular prompt. Sarah Selicki, who is, she, she focuses more on um, novels and short stories, but she has a great, she always, she has like writing prompts that she gives out. And I think that, try that, like try a prompt, just try anything um, that is not me sitting down and trying to execute whatever the particular writing thing that is that I'm supposed to do. I would also encourage if you're feeling resistance to do that two minute writing out of your resistance before you write. Getting in the body. Okay. Uh, but I think you, Marina, did you clarify? No, not yet. Okay. Um, so yeah, physical work, writing out the resistance. Um, also tell yourself that you do not have a block. So again, we like, this has become this identity and this label. Like I, we have creative block. Uh, what if you don't have creative block? What if you're a person who does not have creative block? And I really just encourage you to shift that story um, and see what happens. So much of the time, the block comes from the pressure to get it right or to have a particular outcome. So the, the mantra of the session, of the writing session can be, I am here to show up for my truth. I'm going to tell the truth today. That is my only responsibility, to turn off the noise and to tell the truth. Um, I, I can't be responsible for anything else. So that's what I'm here to do. Um, and then I will go edit it later. So what happens a lot with block is that we're trying to be in multiple stages of the creative process at once. So the generative stage is one stage. The, the, our, the research and development stage is another stage. The editing phase is another stage. And the packaging and shipping phase is another stage. And you, have you ever noticed where you're like, you sit down to do something and you're trying to do all four of those things at once? And it can really keep you from doing any of them effectively. And they're all important and they all just require this. I have a client who literally had hats made. Hats that say writer and then editor and then marketer because we're doing, many of us are doing that for our work, but if we are trying to do all four of those things at once, how could anyone create at that time? It would be like you're, you know, trying to get off book while also block a scene while also um, they do the final shot. You know, it's not, it's not setting yourself up for success. So it's also being clear with yourself, what stage am I in? And if you need to like ritualize that by getting a hat or having different colored candles, I heard about that from a writer. She has different colored candles that like she lights when she's doing different stages of her work because they're like triggers and they're anchors and they help your, your nervous system know, okay, oh, we're going to just do this one for now. Um, oh, by the way, uh, Rebecca, it just came to me. <laughs> Rebecca Godsnell. She's amazing. Look her up on the internet if you want to do an American accent. Okay. Um, I hope that helps. Uh, I'm going to go to another question. Melissa, should I just go to the chat here? Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Martin says, I'm super creative. Yes, you are. You're all super creative. Thank you for naming that. But I've always had difficulties to debunk and relax after very productive creative days and hours. I tend to operate on very high levels, but do burn out once in a while. Yeah. So my question for you would be, in addition to your focused creative time, are you also scheduling white space on your calendar? White space meaning nothing is scheduled at this time. White space meaning... Um, I am just going to show up that day, whatever that day is, and sort of follow my impulses or do whatever it is that I need to. That might be self-care. That might be taking a walk. I really notice a correlation between sustaining creative work and those kind of activities like walking, like resting, um, like like curated inputs, so like nourishing things, like reading and, and watching things that feel like nourishing to your creativity. And usually, I think we need a balance, like writing intense writing sessions and writing six or seven hours a day with some of that more white space time. I don't have the data yet to prove it. I may have to get a PhD to give you this data. But um, I think that once we start scheduling, and this, I encourage anyone who's trying to level up in any area of your life, we actually need to schedule more white space time. It's counterintuitive. You will resist it in your brain. You'll be like, but that's not productivity. But that's what actually is like this creativity is a mystical process. It's not a by the numbers process. So saying I'm actually going to make more space 
and then see what happens. And everything I, I um, work on, I think of as an experiment. So anything I've said to you today or anything you want to try, any of those steps you shared with me, just think of it as an experiment because no one's way is the right way. It's just what works for you. And so experiment. Okay, let's say I book out two hours of white space time a week for four weeks. And then check in at the end of four weeks. Huh, how did I feel? Did that help my creative process? If it didn't, then scrap it. Um, but that's what I would say, Martin, is, is actually that if you notice burnout coming, then that means we want to preemptively schedule more non-doing time. It's a revolution. Non-doing, it's a revolution. Um, but it see how it affects your creativity. Turner says, I find myself getting frustrated with the business side of things, sides, casting, agent communications, contract rates. How can I shift from career and business with win-loss thinking joy? I might need a little clarification on that, Turner. How can I shift from career to win-loss thinking joy? But I think I'm, I think I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing that it can be hard to bring your create your joy to some of those conversations, maybe particularly right now. I need a little clarification. Um, but usually this says to me, like you have, you could use more time in a creative process that you own so that like, okay, if I'm going to be emailing the agent a lot this week, or if I'm, if I'm doing a ton of, um, contract negotiations and everything. Again, it's, I need to schedule some replenishment because creative practice is not always just to produce something. Sometimes it is a mental health practice and sometimes it is what your artist needs to fuel to keep going. Um, correct. Acting should be joyous or creative, but my brain goes to unhappiness with the contracts and business junk. Well, and again, if everything is a door, right, I actually encourage you to liberate yourself from any kind of should. So okay, maybe acting isn't feeling joyous and creative for Cause that's the kind of pressure too to be like, this is supposed to feel amazing. And I'm always supposed to love doing this. Okay. What if I don't love doing this right now? Huh? What's going on for me? Let's get curious about that before we even put the pressure on it to be joyful. Try doing something you love to do when you were little, like make an appointment to do something that you just sort of your something from your original spark phase and see again, with curiosity, not with the pressure of like, I got to get my joy back. Um, but make that gentle invitation to joy. Um, and see what happens if you like bring your little inner spark to your meetings. I don't mean let them negotiate, but I mean like the second I say that, I see literal energy coming out of the Zoom screens. And all of you are in the business, and many of you are in the business of, like, energy is part of your currency. Like, people pay you lots of money to have this energy. And so um, we kind of think, like, okay, these things are so separate, the business and creativity. But I also think one of the things that's happening in our world right now is those divisions on, like, my business and my creativity, my activism and my art, they're starting to integrate and no longer can we keep them all separate. So business doesn't have to be this bad thing. What if business, what if I bring my little light to my business meetings, then what happens? Um, okay. Um, Steve says I get, I, when I get, start writing, I get sleepy. I have never received that question. I am fascinated by it. If anyone else experiences that, I would love to know. And I really appreciate these questions because they always make me think in new ways. When are you writing? That is my question. And do you drink caffeine? <laughs> are you bringing coffee to your writing sessions? Uh, I, I would encourage you, Steve, to try. We're not, I'm not going to make you do it right now, but I often teach a shaking practice. It's sort of loosely based on a Qigong practice, if anyone is familiar with Qigong. But you do not need to know Qigong to do this. If you put on the timer and shake your body for two minutes to whatever physically, whatever you're able to do physically, don't compromise yourself, but whatever you're able to do, shake in the whole body, shake your legs, shake everything as much as you possibly can for two full minutes. And then notice what your energy feels like afterward, because I've never given that exercise to someone who doesn't then feel a flow of energy in their, in themselves. Um, and trying that before you write, 
you may just need some kind of an activator, a physical activator, and then caffeine. <laughs> and try, yeah, again, with like in the spirit of experimenting with your process and all we're doing is just trying different environmental conditions and mindset shifts and seeing how they affect us. Um, especially in the spirit of reinventing our creative process, shake it up, start writing somewhere different. I know we don't have that many options right now, but like <laughs> try a new window in your house if you can't, or just say like, okay, I've been doing it this way. I've been doing it this way. I've been doing this way. Try something else. Stand or um, just do something to shake it up and then see what happens. Uh, Rebecca says that when you do the two minute block thing, like when I ask you to write out your resistance for two minutes, it feels counterproductive in a self-centered, in a whiny way. Okay, sure. So, I mean, I would say if it doesn't work for you, definitely don't do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it will feel whiny. So it's not going to be pleasant to let the resistance talk out. What we are trying to do is to give it more um, clear containers and then distance ourselves from those containers. So I even have people who write that out and then rip it up. Because um, we really do have to be r rigorous around those inner critic voices. So, uh, yeah, I would just say, um, if it doesn't work for you, don't do it. But um, it's okay if you feel whiny. It is kind of, it can be a kind of whiny voice. And remember, it's not you. It is just a, a voice that you are experiencing. I would say this is probably the last one. And can you speak a bit more about what you mean by container? Oh, containers, yes. Just that there's a couple ways I speak about containers. And one is just to have a container for your ideas. And I literally mean a Google Doc on your computer, whatever you work with, that or a journal or some, or even your notes app. But I don't want you to have it in a million places. If anyone knows that experience of like, I have it in this journal and this napkin and over here. The more you can actually just sort of save your creativity I'm going to put this like future ideas doc, really, it could be the doc, but just have one so that anytime it comes to you, and by the way, it usually comes at inopportune times, like when you're in a business meeting, that's when it comes, or like when you have all these commitments that aren't fun, that's when the ideas come, um, or you're in the shower. But go write it down because that's sending the message that I want more of them, and I'm ready, and I can't address all of them right now. So that's what I mean by just a container for the ideas. And then I also use the word container just around sort of defining projects. Once you do decide to say, okay, I'm going to take this, I'm going to work on this web series, that we just start to, to create some definition around what we're working on so that, um, so that we can be wild in the process. We need to have some parameters. And so a container can also be like, I'm going to work on this project for this amount of time, this every day, you know, this week, or I'm going to put together this kind of production schedule for myself, even if I don't have an outside production um, team asking me for it, I'm going to put together that schedule so that I can use those deadlines and containers of time as ways to empower the process. I hope that helps. These are great questions and I, and I wish I could answer more of them, but I'm sure that we're all ready to, I, I definitely know there's a max on Zoom. You got to give yourself a break. <laughs>